Thank you for coming. Allow me a second to um, formally introduce myself to you in my language. Hadalas at untesonti gudele lagen, gist akas kustri alagen, diu hat agen, stas dis digwai kaigan ai uijung, di klingai klakia ai gagen, stas loa hinudekeang, kuida hinudekeang, windy smith yatsakit hinudekeang, Donna Douglas di al uijung, Alec. Ruth Douglas de Chin de Nanu Ejun, Sam Elsie Douglas de Chin de Nanu Ejun, Sanuhat Kate de Chin de Nanu Ejun, Hikta Handalai Stuth Ejun. So I said, Good people, I'm happy to be here with you today. I am Alaska Native Haida of the Eagle Manaiti of the Fish Egg House. And in my introduction, I always introduce myself as a Haida scientist as a way of um, encouraging students of diversity to see themselves as both their racial and cultural identity and their profession. Um, in my community, well, well my Haida name is Gstahlawa, and before you leave, you're gonna all have to say it before we let you out the doors. Uh, my elders named me that, um, it means laughing lady, because I laugh loud, and they said it brings them joy. And when my auntie named me, she kind of gave me the side eye and looked at me and she said, but I've seen you with your students, so I'm gonna name you Kuida as well. So I'm laughing lady, who will sit you down when you need it? So, <laughs> um, that's my Haida name. Uh, my English name is Wendy Smythe. And in my community, as in many indigenous and uh, culturally diverse communities, we're not known as individuals. That's only in uh, academia, we have to be, we're an individual. But I told you, when I meet people, I have to tell them who my family is. So I told you that I'm the daughter of Donna Douglas, the granddaughter of Alec and Ruth Douglas, the great-granddaughter of Sam and Elsie, great-great-great-great-granddaughter of Sunuhut and Kate, and my people come from Heidelberg, Alaska. So I'm gonna talk today, if you can read that, anybody wanna read that? No, it says, I am a Haida scientist, I'm an observer of the world, and I'm gonna talk about fostering inclusive education practices from K through 12 uh, into funding agencies. But first, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We are on native land of the Duwamish people, which include uh, the Nisqually, Samish, Coastal Salish, and Skagit people. And I wanna acknowledge that they've been here for 10,000 years or more, and that I'll thank them for allowing me to speak my language on their land and share my culture on their land. The Uhatagan, I am Haida. I'm gonna tell you briefly who I am, where I'm from, and then we're gonna take a canoe journey together. This is my family. Uh-oh, that's not my family, hang on. Let me go back. This is my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Chief Sanuhat, and his family. This is my great-grandmother. She always had that expression on her face, even as a little girl. She taught me how to crochet, and she would always rip it all out and do it again. So she taught me a lesson every time. These people bred this. This is 13-year-old me in Heidelberg, Alaska with these amazingly large glasses playing Atari in an awesome rainbow unicorn shirt. That tells you how old I am, I played Atari. This person never imagined, ever imagined, that she would be a cultural practitioner in her community. A scientist, a geoscientist, an oceanographer. She never imagined that she would be an activist, getting the honor and the ability to march with the Native People's Climate March, DACA, and Women's Rights. Never. And most importantly, I never imagined that I would be able to go home to my community and mentor the next generation of our, our people into science and technology, engineering and math. That's a brief bit of who I am. This is where I'm from. This is Heidelberg, this is a bit of who we are. Our culture is still alive, our language is still alive. We have two people who speak our language fluently. We're, trying to, we're working to reclaim that and I'll talk more about that. But this is where I'm from, this is where I grew up. When I left Alaska, I knew what ravens and eagles and boats sounded like, and I moved to Portland, Oregon, and didn't leave the house for two years, till my sister, 
who's in the front here, moved, moved down there and drug me out of the house. Because it was terrifying, and that's something I'm going to talk about as a stressor for students. What I do, I'm a geoscientist. I work in groundwater ecosystems, looking at iron and manganese, biomineralization, biogeochemical cycling. I work in native education, coupling STEM disciplines with traditional knowledge, culture, and language for K-12 education. And never in a million years did I ever think I would end up working in the federal government in policy. That's what I've been doing the last two years. And it's been um, challenging and rewarding at the same time. But I want to convince you today that astrobiology and traditional ways of knowing have a lot of commonalities. We have a lot of misconceptions of what we're talking about when we talk about astrobiology. There's a lot of misconceptions of what we're talking about when we talk about traditional knowledge. And when we were having these conversations about what is the differences, I came up with cultural and scientific differences. That it's all valid. It's just how mainstream society perceives what we're doing, right? Is there value in traditional knowledge? And what does astrobiology mean? Most people know what it means based on what they get from TV or movies, right? And there's a fear. There's a fear that we're going to find something and we're not going to be the only ones here. We have our own language. When you talk in your discipline, you have your own language. And when you talk across discipline, you use different words. It's the same. We have different language. We have different words. So there's some commonalities. And so through this journey, I want to encourage you to find if there's something in here that you can take to increase diversity in discipline. That's in my next slide. In discipline or human, human diversity, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, gender. Diversity enriches our life. It puts us at the leading edge of technology. If we all see the same thing, we're not getting anywhere. An example I like to use is in Alaska, we have these amazing, you probably have them here too, uh, cedar logs. And if we say that this is in your lab, in your research, that cedar log is your hypothesis, question, or problem, something you need to solve. And I can survey this room, what would you do with this cedar log? Some people would make firewood. Some people would build a house, build furniture, and someone else will build a canoe. We're water people, we build canoes out of cedar logs. But there's different ways of approaching these problems, and the beauty and diversity allows us to do this more effectively and quicker. But the issue with diversity also is we always have the promise, right? We're gonna recruit you and it's gonna be amazing. You're gonna have a fabulous career, you're going to publish, you're going to learn, you're going to do all this amazing stuff. But the reality is when we recruit our students, the retention is the problem. They end up isolated on a broken bridge alone. And that's a stressor. And we have to learn to address that within our disciplines and when we engage diverse communities. So that's some background information. So now we're going to take this canoe journey together. And so as we go through the slides, each step along this way, um, that picture is uh, blurry for a reason. And as I moved through my career and moved through this journey, it became more in focus of what I was doing and why. So I started with Alaska Native Education. And I did that because I was the only Haida. I went to ACES, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society conference in uh, 2008. And there was no other Haida there. And I was, that was very disappointing. And I decided that we were going to we're going to change this. So I went home and started just working in the community, working with the tribe, asking what do they need, working with them, not on them. There's a difference in how we approach communities, right? We've been worked on a lot. But it's time to partner with and work with. And that takes a lifelong learning. Just like you want to learn and you constantly stay up to date on your research and the techniques and methods, it's the same way with diversity. You have to continually learn. You don't get a certificate and instantly know and know it the rest of your life. So we started this program with the objective of creating culturally aligned STEM education for K-12 students while providing cultural background for practitioners, for the teachers, in an ethical and culturally responsible way. And our stakeholders were our students, our teachers and administrators, and the community. In the school, in the community of Heidelberg, there's 350 people. 
101 of those are students in K through 12. Um, when we started the program, they had no Haida language in the school. When I was in school, we had Haida language and art. When I went back, it was gone. So we started bringing that back into the school, and now they do from 6th to 12th grade, they have Haida language. All the teachers are non-native. They come in, they teach, they leave. And that sets up a power dynamic within the school where the students pit their parents against the teachers. You don't know who I am, it's us and them. And that is not a productive learning environment for the students. So designing curriculum with our culture and knowledge in there is giving these teachers an advantage. Um, in Alaska, unfortunately, it's like the Wild West for school, for education. There's not really any standards. You can do whatever you want, pretty much what you want in the classroom. And that can be really great because you can do some very innovative, amazing curriculum and education projects with your students, or you can pretty much let them watch TV and do whatever they want, which is what was happening. Emphasis on was. Uh, this year, we opened our first um, immersion. I told you there was only two fluent speakers of our language. We opened our first immersion school called Hansinai. It's three through five-year-old. It is our first generation in 100 years who speak Haida as their first language. There's two speakers that teach at the school, and there's five apprentices. And the idea, what we're hoping to do, is taking the work that we've done with the education, the science education, and developing and growing the language by giving a science glossary to the elders to develop work. We had no word for computer. We had no word for bacteria. We have to grow, so we're growing the language, and we're reclaiming it at the same time. The apprentices are going to get their teaching certificate and teach these kids all through school. They're going to learn in Haida, hopefully. That's the goal. We're also currently working to um, my dream. The reason I went back and got my PhD was to start a tribal college in Alaska. And we're getting a little bit closer every day. Last year, we got the land. Now we're working to get accreditation and the funding to build the facility. But we have to, before we start doing any curriculum or teaching, we have to know what these students are going to face. And that is perceptions of self. Can I be a scientist? I can tell you 13-year-old me didn't think that. The environment is so different. That's a stressor that we often don't consider because we live in a society where we're not isolated. Is there support from the community? Keep in mind, if you're, let me say, I don't want to single anybody out, but if you're 60 or older, in your lifetime, it was illegal for me to speak Haida and practice my culture. The community, my mother is 70. She was in the boarding school generation. Boarding school trauma, that historical trauma, is alive and well in Indian country. So that what that does is gives a perception in a lot of communities that education is bad. It's gonna damage you, it's gonna hurt you, you're gonna lose your culture, you're gonna get abused, you're gonna get hurt. So we have to change that culture within the community of what getting an education means. And if your community and your family doesn't support you, you're not going to succeed. Knowledge base, again, I told you about the standards alignment in the state. Um, we're working on that, but are, are they up to par when they wanna go to college? I can tell you we're not. I, it took me nine years to get an associate's degree and six years when I got up to par to get my PhD. It, it takes time to catch up. Financial, even if the grants and scholarships are there, if the parents don't know where to look and the students don't know where to look, they're not going to apply, and that money means nothing. The expectations, so I can go in there and tell a student, you're going to be a scientist and they can go off to school, and the reality is very different. You don't just walk in and walk out with a degree. You have to put the work in, you've got to do the chemistry, the biology, you've got to do all these classes, and they're not prepared for that. School resources, and that comes from PIs, I think, when you're recruiting diverse students, are you prepared for the need of that student? And tokenism. I think that is one of the most damaging um, things that is not thought about. Um, and I say that because I, am, I represent my family right now. I'm speaking to you as a Hadass woman. I'm representing my community. I can tell you time and time again that I have had PIs tell me I couldn't be a scientist. They were my mentors. You can't be a scientist, but I want to put you on this grant. I want to work in your community. But you're not a scientist. I just need you. 
So now you're asking me that you put me in a moral dilemma. You put your students in a moral dilemma of choosing to move forward in their career and be successful or use their community and their family to get you ahead. And it's not thought of like that, but we have to start thinking of what we're asking our students to do and our early career faculty to do. Don't just put someone on there to get the grant. Put them on there because they're gonna enrich and help you move forward and you need their help. So what we did, we reimagined STEM education. I call it the, um, we, we used a new approach. I often call recruitment and retention, recruitment specifically, the hit and run approach. We find a student, they're doing fabulous, I'm gonna recruit you. Not considering the needs of that student to have the ties with their family, the obligations they have in the summertime, a lot of students have to go harvest, that's not considered. So when we went in, and this was in my own community, I had to work two years with my elders to get permission to teach in the school. So think of how it is when you go from outside, your, uh, outside the community trying to work with them, it's, a, it's difficult. But we started with the elders, we worked through the community, and it, we finally got to where students work with us and are going to school, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We keep the community involved, we have a science fair every year, the students do presentations. It's their only time ever doing a public presentation. I bring seven to eight scientists up from any field if they want to come. They contact me. We do an interview. We talk about the environment, what, they, what is and can and can't be done. Um, they come in and do hands-on demonstrations so that the community, the students, get this enrichment that they wouldn't have seen before. But talking about science is one thing. Getting to do the hands-on part is another. We also brought in native mentors. Um, and I say I failed my students in the beginning because the first two or three years, I only brought non-natives because I really wanted PIs and graduate students to understand what it was like to work with our communities. But I wasn't giving the students what they needed. They needed native mentors. And once I realized that, and I'll show you the, the impact that had um, in a couple slides. So I started bringing ed engineers, educators, cultural practitioners up and um, doing work with us. Now we've had 40 students go to ACES I'm not the only one there. We worked cross um, intertribal collaborations, and I do that, and, and what I like to talk about with that is, sometimes you, I'm the only native you're gonna meet, and I represent every native person. An Indian is an Indian is an Indian, and that's simply not true. There are 567 federally recognized tribes, 220 in the state of Alaska. We have a similarity, a commonality, we're sovereign nations, we have our own IRBs, we have our own protocols for working with our communities, but that is something that's not really understood. As we move farther along the canoe journey, we started working with the students, it was going good, students are engaged now, teachers are engaged, but we started talking to teachers and they said, I just don't know what to do, the students are pitting their family against me, I don't know what to do, I'm like, this is the first time in their life, they're the only non-native in the room. It's the first time. And they're there for nine months. What do they do? They stay home. They go to work and they stay home. So we develop curriculum in a nested approach, using culture, language, elders, the needs of the community, place-based, project-based learning. Two points, two reasons to do that. One was to give the students, they know their culture, they know our creation story, they know our stories, but they don't see science in it. When you ask them, what do you know? They hunch over, I don't know anything. Tell me where you fish. And we start mapping it out and then tying science into it. You see this complete change in how they perceive themselves. Oh, where I go fishing, there's ecology, ocean chemistry, biology, there's everything involved in that. So, so that for they can see the validity of our knowledge system and how it allows them to be a scientist. For the teachers, we needed to give them some information that they weren't getting, and that was giving them traditional stories. So we did five curriculum chapters, all with a uh, traditional story. Each story goes from K through 12. There's a curriculum module with each story. So as that student moves through school, they see another piece of science. And examples are creation, let's see if that's our next slide, yes. Our creation story talks about where we came from. It's 
grounded in spirituality, supernatural beings, where we came from. But we tied that into evolution and taught evolution using that story. Using culture engaged the students and engaged the teachers. And an example of that is we've, if you've taught, if you TA'd or taught students before or high school kids, what do they do when you start talking to them about pH in chemistry? Nodding off, right? See so that head jerk over and over, glazed over. They start having these distracting behaviors because if you're distracted by what I'm doing, you're not going to call on me to answer your question. So we started another way, reimagining STEM. And I said, OK, we weave with spruce roots. Tell me what you know about it. And again, we made the list. You have to have a certain type of beach where to get the roots. The, the soil has to have a certain acidity. OK, why? And they go through it. Acidic soil makes the roots stringy, and they, t they break, and you can't weave. So then we start tying and coupling that with geology, algebra to weave, chemistry, botany. We tie it all in. And we develop these curriculum modules. This is what they look like. Uh, this is, oh, sorry. I hit the wrong thing. Climate change using totem poles for dendrochronology. Ocean acidification using shipworms as uh, indicators of environmental health right here and here. And there's this project alone the students have been doing for nine years. The data that they got from this project was turned over to the tribe, and the tribe got a $3 million grant from the state of Alaska for remediation of their marina. They're doing science within their community for the benefit of their community. And we're also doing workforce development as well as creating jobs for these students when they, if they decide not to go to school. That's fine. They have a job in the community. So we created science learning opportunities. Through the science fair, place-based learning, conferences are extremely important. That's their one time to go three to five days outside this community and come to Seattle, New Mexico, wherever, wherever the conference is held. And they get that little bit of exposure in a peer group where they feel safe, and they get to go back home and they think through that. And those students who have participated are the ones that are going to college. They're more prepared when they go. They do internships uh, with us. Um, we always work, do their internships where one day a week they do culture. So they go and help their family harvest or whatever. They have to do a culture day. And they're happy to do that. We work cross-discipline. Whatever they want to learn, all I tell them is if you want to learn something, you need to tell me and I'll find someone who wants to teach you inquiry-based, and culturally aligned. So with the multiple ways of knowing, what is the benefit of it? Well, we have these holistic knowledge systems, right, for traditional ways of knowing. When I talk about, when I ask them about weaving, they're going to tell me all this stuff about chemistry and botany and biology, but to them it's one thing. It's one knowledge system. And that's how they think, and I know that because that's how I would think. But when they go into academia, what do we get? And we know this. If we're in geoscience and astrobiology, it is very hard to work with people who want the pure science, right? Because everything's compartmentalized. It has to be just geology. It has to be just chemistry. And that's a different way of thinking. It's not a holistic way. Everything's not connected. And so our students struggle to think, to flip in and out of this way of thinking. So if we can do this and teach them to think like this when they're in um, pre-college, the hope is that they'll be able, and what we've seen, is they're able to talk to two different groups of people seamlessly. They can talk across discipline. They can talk to their family using holistic knowledge. They can talk to us at the school talking in this compartmentalized way. And what that does is it gives them the ability to develop critical thinking skills earlier than they would have. So when they go to college, they have critical thinking skills, and it gives them an advantage. So the community change, what did we see? So I told you the first two or three years, um, what I would ask them, and I do it every year, um, we have 75 students from fifth to 12th grade, and what I ask them to do is close your eyes, and, and I count to 10. And then when you, I'm, gonna say, I'm gonna say a word, and I want you to write the first three things you think of. And they all came, 75 kids came up with seven words, white, Male, bald, crazy hair, you know, the typical stereotypical things we see in cartoons, 
in mainstream media for what a scientist is. And as far as I know, in my community, that person doesn't live there. We always say, and we're crazy, we have a weird sense of humor, but that person doesn't live there. So after I started bringing in native scientists, we asked them again in one year, and we saw a change. Now, and so keep in mind, 70% of our students are female, and none of them identified as a scientist in the first three years. Now we have female, we have native, respect, yathdung is one of our core cultural values. We teach our students, and we teach the teachers to say that too, so when a kid acts up, we're like, you're not acting with your yathdung. They start behaving, because they know but the interesting thing, and you know on a word cloud, the bigger the word, the more it's said, the smaller the word. But the cool thing is, curly hair, short, tall, that is a student describing themselves as a scientist. And there's only two students with curly hair. That was amazing to me to see. They expanded their definition by 19 words, but now they're saying, I'm a scientist. The girls are saying, I can be a scientist. That was amazing and a profound shift in what they thought they could be and what they could do with their life. The other changes we saw, and so I took in the red, is my cohort of students from the last 10 years. I know everybody in town, so I mapped out the cohort ahead of them. And what we saw is 19% went to college, 5% to degree completion. Right now we have 60 to 68% attending college or trade school. Two just graduated with an associate's degree and they're going back to get their bachelor's. We saw a shift in a lot of the girls were having children immediately in their senior year or right after high school. That has dropped by half because they're going to college. To me, another one of the most important things is, is the addictive behavior, alcoholism, drug addiction went down by 65%. And that is a decrease, that leads to a decrease in suicide as well. And so when we saw this shift in ideology of, I have a value for myself now. I can be something, I'm not stuck here. Somebody's telling me I can do something that I never thought I could do. And this is the first time a lot of them have told that. So the canoe's getting a little bit more in focus here. So as I noticed my students going to school, I'm out in academia, it's a party, right? When you're a grad student, postdoc, especially when you're trying to run your own native education program and your PI does not want you doing that. So um, there are instances where I published my first paper in native education and my PI threw it across the table and said, I don't care, this doesn't matter. Chapter seven of your dissertation, doesn't matter, I don't care. Just put this on the grant, we don't care. To me, that was horrifying. And I realized that we have to make an institutional change in academia, in industry, and especially at funding agencies, because th that is where the money starts and that drives policy. When you give money, it drives policy. And I don't want to recruit these students into science and convince them, you should go to school and be a scientist and be told what you think doesn't matter. The way you see the world doesn't matter. Because we'd, we, we've had, what I say is if your mentor isn't serving you, find a new mentor. It's easier said than done. I've had it happen over and over. It's hard to do because you feel like you are, if you leave and move to a new mentor, you're gonna be tainted or talked about or you're gonna be considered a problem. Luckily for me, that doesn't bother me. I'm fine with that. But students are not okay with that. It is a very difficult thing to do. There's a power dynamic, right? Students in early career, there's a power dynamic. How dare you say something when I'm the PI and you're just a student? How dare you say something? And then we were in the position of saying, well, now I have to represent my community. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? So I, what I did, we, we worked on the culture and language. We're having this shift in our community. I started working in academia. Um, we had our first uh, PI meeting. We run the Field Institute. It is NSF funded. Uh, we took 30 PIs last year up to a Colorado mountain campus where they had no Wi-Fi and cell signal and they were just thrilled. Uh, <laughs> but we needed to do that because it was four days of bystander training, 
native culture, LGBTQ, religion, disability, African American. That was our PI group. And we're talking to people who've never had to talk about this. And I can tell you, after the first night, I was really threatening to get on my suitcase and roll down that mountain because it wasn't going well on night one. But by the end of it, we had come to a mutual understanding of what we need to, we need to accept who we are. We are told who we are by society, right? We're told who people are. I've met person after person who said, oh, you're just a drunk Indian. I don't like native people because they're drunk. I don't drink. But that's who we're told we are. And we have to change that. When we're from diverse backgrounds, we are told who we are and you're told who we are. And you don't see us for who we are. And we had to sit there and explain that to people who've never really thought about it. That's not who she is. We have hypersexualization of native women with costumes. We're mascots, which make us not real people. We're cartoons. We're unicorns. I've been called a unicorn many times. Oh, you're a native scientist. It happens. We have to change that idea. And so we, we do a workshop with that, and we went really great. And we're going to do two more this year. Institutional, foundational change. So I went to NSF in my fellowship because I wanted to see what was and wasn't getting funded, and what was the justification? What was the idea? What was the thinking? What was the process of what was happening? Year one, I was in education. Year two, I'm in geoscience to get the education and science ideas. There's different cultures, again, in education and, ge and geoscience. And I sat and listened for one year and decided to start doing workshops because people act with good intentions, but it's not always the right thing to do. And it's very hard to tell someone, thank you for doing that, but please stop. Just, you've got to find the right way of doing that, right? So I'm going to end this canoe journey talking about how we did that. Identify the need. I needed to tell program officers who we were. Because when I came in, and it still happens, uh, if someone gets a proposal focused on indigenous communities, I'm called right away and I'm asked to advise. I don't know every tribe. It's really, it's really like, oh, okay. It happens because they don't know anybody else. Identify the need. And the need was for training on how to evaluate indigenous proposals and work in Indian country. Learn the culture. What was the culture at NSF? What was the culture in each directorate at NSF that asked me to help them? How do I approach these people who have been doing their job 25 and 30 years and saying, I think we can do this another way? Because I don't want to offend them. They're trying to do the right thing. But they've never engaged with a native person to say, you know, this is what native Indian country thinks of this. How can we fix this together? Develop a plan on how you're going to do that. What are you going to do? A workshop, one-on-one -on -one discussion, discussion groups, internal white paper. What are you going to do? And be brave. It's not easy. It's not easy. Um, the, what I say is uh, I'm the only Haida in SF, and they all know because I, I drum. They hear me drumming down the hall. They all know I'm coming. Um, but every tribe's not like that. I'm from a matriarchal tribe. And my auntie always said, don't ever look down. No matter what, you don't ever look down. You can cry when you get home, but don't you look down. And that's how I operate. And when I first went to NSF, some of the most shockingly racist things were said to me. And I had to sit there and listen to it. I was told I was an uneducated native. I had to sit there and listen to that and not say anything and not react. Because when we react, what do you see? You see how I act. You don't learn the lesson. When we react, you see the actions of the person who's hurt, but you don't learn that I did something to do this. Be brave. Be brave enough to say something, and that's when you find your voice. A lot of people, it's hard to speak up. I understand that. And when we're working across discipline, it's hard to have those conversations as to why one discipline or the other is right or wrong or how we can work together or not. It's hard for diversity as well. Facilitate change in the way that you are comfortable doing it. Because if you're not comfortable doing it, you're going to stress out. 
and you're going to stumble, and nobody's going to listen to you. So you got to think about how you're going to do it and facilitate change, however's best for you, because you're going to be most effective, right? When you're doing your science, if you know what you're doing, you're effective. You're not going to just go do a, a technique you don't know. Sometimes you might, just to see. But most of the time, you're going to do something to facilitate change and a response and a reason and action. And finally, create opportunity. Create opportunity for change. And we can do this in a positive way where we change the disciplines, we change how we interact with each other, we change how we understand the world together and how we envision the world being. And finally, here's where we make friends, guys. I'm going to ask you to stand. Some of you are spread out, but stand. Oh. <laughs> and if you can touch the person's hand next to you, touch the person's hand next to you. This is your network. These are your colleagues. These are your people. What happens up here will move through that network and affect the person at the back. It takes time, but it will get there. Everything is related, and we need each other to survive. We need other disciplines to move our science forward, and we needed the human diversity to see the world in a different way. OK, you can quit making friends. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Do you have any questions? And actually, I want to quickly um, acknowledge the two amazing artists. Um, Beth Lepense is at Michigan State University. She did all the space canoe images. And one of my favorite artists in the world, because she's my daughter, is Lauren Smythe. And she did all the Haida art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. So the, this uh, talk is now open for questions. And there are microphones. There are four microphones in the room. So please. Should I ask you? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes. OK, right here. Hello, I'm Anthony Chan. Um, I appreciate your example of a uh, weaving of the roots, wasn't it, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, introduce uh, pH acidity. Yep. Um, I was wondering, how do you integrate or bridge uh, creation narratives, which may be emotive, conscious, yep. intention-based, with uh, a physicalist paradigm? Yes. So creation. Ooh. So we did, that was so interesting you asked that right off. So we started writing the curriculum when I was at the Center for Evolution and Action. <laughs> and in my mind, we, we, we used our creation story. And one of our people, one of our people freaked out because we were talking about our creation story, not creationism as in religion. So we used our vision, our story of what creation is, and then we started tying that into evolution because the story talks about Raven opening a clam, and these pitiful white, clear, translucent things come out, and Bear gives his fur, so we have hair, Eagle gives his claws, so we have fingernails, and Seal gives his flesh so we can eat. And our duty is to take care of the land, and the land will take care of us. And so we started teaching that in evolution, talking about divergent evolution, because when you look at the beings changing, but we don't tie it into creationism and religion. Is that what you're asking? We don't talk about that. We're talking about creation from our perspective, because it had not dawned on me at the time to do that. But when we do the lesson plan, we do talk about that, but we, we do it from the perspective of our version of creation. Does that answer your question? Margaret? Oh. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it strikes me when I listen to you that um, what you had was the benefit of time because you really were working in the community with the children. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for someone who does volunteer work and reaches out going into communities? Obviously, um, I'm white. Um, go into communities where children are poorer and um, of different ethnic groups. Are there things that you can suggest where you're going into their established schools yep. to be more effective? Yeah, um, one is have an ally. There's always got to be, there's a contact that anchors you into that environment, number one. Number, like I said, it was my own community. It took two years. I had a friend, someone I grew up with, 
who was the mayor and the environmental planner, small community, he does both, he hosted us there until people were more comfortable. They remembered me from being a kid, but I was a brat, and they were like, oh, why is she back? But um, <laughs> they're like, what is she gonna do now? Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, having that ally on the ground that you can work with, and then the other thing I would say, patience. It takes time to build those relationships. There's an expect, one of the first questions I was asked is, how much salary are you drawing to do this? What, what are you getting paid to be here, and are you gonna leave when the money runs out? <laughs> that is always in the mind of, of these groups. What, what are you gonna do, what are you here for? So patience and persistence. So the anchor person to, to host you and facilitate, patience and persistence. And active learning, again, active learning for diversity initiatives. How do you handle the language problem? Well, you have a visitor come in who's a specialist in some special scientific yeah. area. They don't know the native language. Mm -hmm. So um, with the language, what we did is, so in the last five years, we've lost all our elders who spoke fluent Haida, because they're 90, 91, 100 years old. But we had one young man who um, took the time, he quit college, and he lived in Heidelberg with his, his grandfather to learn Haida. So he's fluent now. We have two people who, um, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, has a um, northern Haida dialect. For our dialect, they got a master's degree. And so now they're in the community teaching. And so we're doing it through the immersion school. But the other thing we did is we made a glossary of science terms when we had our elders. And we put, they wanted two or three, two or three, uh, I'm trying to explain a computer in two or three words. They wanted a simple definition so that they could build words. And we were, we were only doing it to try to add that to a glossary. But what happened was the young man who's now teaching Lahaida, he learned how to build words. So now he can facilitate adding science terms. So we're, we, we do Haida language classes. I'm on the board of directors for our language reclamation for our community. We have adult learning. We have um, children intermediate learning. We have the preschool learners. And um, a very interesting thing in September, when we started, hosted, and opened this Hunting Eye Immersion Program, 70 and year olds did not want that program. They were not allowed to speak Haida. They were beaten for speaking Haida. They were punished for speaking Haida. So it was a fear that they didn't know they had. But now it's changing, and we're trying to continue that change. And with the, the babies speaking Haida now, there's not a lot of choice. They're, they're learning it, and, and they're getting more comfortable with it. But uh, it was a slow process, and it takes time. It's a hard language to speak, and um, it, it's, it takes time. And it's very, it's all in here, and it hurts. <laughs> it hurts to speak it. But um, we're just trying day by day, offering classes and encouraging. And one of the other things I did is a lot of our youth were embarrassed to speak Haida because they're only in the community together. So when I bring colleagues that are Diné, Pueblo, Anishinaabe, they speak their language, but they're in, they're in, they're connected. They're not on a remote island in Alaska. They're, you know, they're on the continent of the United States. They know people speak their language in their community in English outside of it. So when I bring these colleagues up, I ask them to introduce themselves initially in their language, and that made a difference too for students being proud and not ashamed to speak Haida. Thank you. Hi, Wendy Osama Elian, also from Michigan State. So go green. Um, I had a question. If you were kind of go a uh, 50,000 foot view where the US is obviously a very multicultural society and science discourse is very mm -hmm. heated nowadays. So if you were to kind of examine some of those lessons that you've learned, what would you draw on as far as solutions for communicating some of these same things to a society that may have the same language, but very different philosophical differences or very different vocabularies in terms of discussing some of these yeah. scientific problems or philosophical right. problems, or even when you have clashes between creationism and non-creationism, yeah. how do you approach that tactfully yeah. and compassionately? So you mean cross-discipline discussions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. OK. Be brave and find your voice. No? <laughs> um, you know. The, it, it, you approach it the same way. I would approach it the same way of, you know, we have to acknowledge in academia that each discipline has a language. It has a culture, and there's a, there's a way of thinking about the world. And sometimes that's really hard to express across discipline, but we have to do it, especially in interdisciplinary sciences with geoscience and astrobiology. 
because we can't all just look at one thing because we're not going to find anything if we do. We're going to stare at the same dot, right? So finding a way, I, find that advocate again to have that change and talk about it publicly. Because we, if we don't talk about it and we don't bring attention to it, we're not going to acknowledge it and change it. I think there was a talk I went to yesterday, the diversity talk, where what do we do when we're in an uncomfortable situation? We laugh or walk away. You know, ha, okay, I don't know what you mean, and walk away. We have to stay there and have those conversations. And we can do that respectfully and in a respectful way with each other. Um, that's Because I've been in departments where we were an astrobiology group, we were in a geology department, and it was a hostile environment. They did not want astrobiology people in that department. It was a pure science, and we were tainting that science. You have to have those discussions. And sometimes people aren't willing to listen. And then you just wait. You find another ally to work with. And you can facilitate change outside your department. That we, like, that's what I've been able to do in some instances as well. But it's not easy. It sounds easy talking about it, but it's not easy. Because you have to go back into that department every day, right? And face those people who do not want to talk about what you do. And they want to stick with just their language and culture and not acknowledge this one. Kathy? Um, first off, I just want to thank you for coming here and sharing your personal experience from such a vulnerable point. Um, and secondly, you had mentioned during your talk that you sometimes come across these instances where people who are trying to help and are well-meaning do things that you really wish they didn't do. And I was wondering if you could kind of speak to some of these common problems that you see when well-meaning people try to do outreach in communities like this. Yeah, so are you talking about, okay, so I can start up and work my way down? I'll try to do that. If I'm off the track, let me know. So first of all, so at, at the funding agency, and I'll say the funding agency, I know there's several others, I can't speak for them, but we talk, they talk about portfolio diversity. And we have this broadening participation agenda, initiative agenda at NSF. So now when diverse proposals come in, oh, I have a native proposal, I'm going to fund it. But if we don't know what it's about, we're just going to fund it anyway because we need that portfolio diversity. But we can't keep working that way. We can't keep moving forward that way. So to ask me again, because I was on a path and I got lost. <laughs> so I guess I was um, trying to see like these things that we do when we do outreach that yes. you really wish we didn't do or we did them in right. a different okay. way. Sorry. Yeah, so we want the diversity, but we can't take everything. We have to learn about it. So if we're going to work with the community, and I speak only for Native people, I have colleagues in other areas of diversity, that is, I can't speak to that because I don't, I don't live that life. They speak it, and I, I can help them and agree with them. But we have to be able to have those conversations, and we have to be able to be willing to learn. We have to be willing to say, you know what? I didn't realize I had this issue with this community. Maybe I should interact differently. Because it's hard to do. We're, we're so busy. We don't think about how we're interacting with people. All we see is that they keep walking away. Right? They don't want us to work here. But why? Why? Ask those questions, those why. And what can I do to help you? Because there's a lot of working on. Native people we've been worked on over and over again. We've been worked on and worked on and worked on. But not with. Work with people and be really sincere about it. And it takes time to learn. And that's OK. We're going to make mistakes, but we're still trying to learn. And be open and willing to learn. I'm going to walk off the edge of the stage. Be open. <laughs> I'll just keep rolling. Um, be open and willing to learn. And, but also, it's, it's hard when someone says, you know, you're not doing that. Can we talk about how you're engaging this community? And you have, we just can't be offended by it. Because there's different ways of interacting with several different communities, right? A community from one state, one tribe, and another tribe have totally different ways of interacting. Does that answer? Yeah. Um, I'm reminded I belong to NPR SciComm. We mostly hang out on Slack, or people do a lot of things. And the diversity group introduced us. There's a book called White Fragility that sort of makes me gag. Um, but. So I was sorry to hear about NSF culture, and I wondered if it's it is changing. Good, it is good. Changing. That's what I hoped. It's changing. I, I don't. I, I go home and cry one day, and then I'm back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm back with my drum, you know. <laughs> and that's why that's why we do the workshops, though, is to bring that out and create mm -hmm. other program officers that can address that. Thank you. Yeah. 
it's not just one founder, it's everywhere. And we just don't think of how we say things and how it can be offensive, right? Yeah, I do too, I love it there, it's great, it's great there. It's just, we have these ingrained cultures within academia, within departments, within institutions and foundations that we, we're so busy going this way, we don't look, we're myopic. We look at one thing and we don't see everything else that's happening and how we're impacting people and communities. We don't see that. And um, bringing that to the attention of people is the only way. Being brave and having a voice and saying, you know what? One of my things, DC, come on. They have the Redskins. And NSF wants to be inclusive of everybody. When I'm walking around and I see these logos in people's cubicles and offices, I don't feel like that's a welcoming environment. Because of the Hatch Act, we can't require people not to put that up. But what I've asked NSF to do is say, if you want to be a truly inclusive environment, ask people to please take it down. You don't have to, but please consider what you're showing. And it's such a normal thing to have mascots and costumes. We're depicted as not real, we're cartoons, we're this, we're that, we're selling fireworks over here and we're drunk over here. That's not who we are. But that's what, we're t that's what you're told we are. And so it, it's hard to change that way of thinking. And I think that addresses what, you're, what you were asking as well is, how, how are these communities identified and how are we interacting with them? Because we interact in the way that we're taught. And sometimes we don't think about it. It's, it's one of those things we have to do this internal examination. What do I think of these people and why do I think this? But it's changing. And I think uh, with the first workshop, I was terrified. I'm gonna have, I had 101 program officers sign up to come. I only expected 20. And uh, I was terrified. We're talking about tribal policy. We're talking about sovereignty. We're talking about, you know, the, the best example I can give you and that I use is if someone, and I'm talking, pretend you're an NSF program officer, you're a federal employee, and I say, hey, I'm from France, and I want to come to NSF, and I want to go through all your data and see what you're doing. You don't have to get me a visa. I'm just coming. We can't do that. There's legalities. There's ways of coming in. That's the same with working with Indian country. They are sovereign nations. And you have to go through the right, a community member cannot grant you access to the tribe. It has to be a tribal leader and the leadership that allows you access. And that's what we were having happen is people were getting these million dollar grants, showing up at the tribe and the tribe was like, nope. And the tribes have the right to say no. They have the right to say no. And so that's one of the things that we talk about and work with program officers. So now they have a check, and then they ask for um, a checklist. They want, well, we have to be very careful. There's legal terms, right, that we can't use. I can't call it a guideline because that implies a mandate, but we can call it a recommendation. And so we made this very broad recommendation of when you get an indigenous focused proposal, here are a few things to consider. But again, there's 567 federally recognized tribes and several hundred more non-federally -rec recognized. We're not all going to have the same protocol, but it's a place to start. And that's all I can ask for, is within two years, I've been able to get program officers to say, yeah, you know what, let's try this another way. Because they didn't have to do that. They could have been very angry with me and walked out of the room. But they invited us to do a second workshop, and they asked for this recommendation. And so I think there's a culture shift and a recognition that we need to do this to really be truly innovative and impactful and inclusive and welcoming. She was sorry, first. I can't see all the mics. <laughs> she was there first. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, um, Ana Gonzalez Valdez. Um, I'm a graduate student. So you mentioned when you were a graduate student, you were doing all of this work, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily with your advisor approving. And I'm finding that a lot of the work to make um, our systems more welcoming to diverse populations are being done by the people affected by it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, uh, I think leads to the retention problem that we're having because yeah. you have students getting burnt out. You, you know all of this. <laughs> but the reason I'm bringing this up is because the field um, program that you mentioned where you're training PIs mm -hmm. sounds like a way to avoid this. If we could have more people just trained in how to properly support yeah. someone from an underrepresented background. Um, so I'm wondering, if you know of more of these programs, where could one find a program like yes, this? I do. Yeah. So um, NSF, Geoscience, came out with the gold, golden 
And if you Google that, uh, in, um, Golden, G, uh, NSF uh, Golden, it is a initiative within the Geoscience Directorate. They did an ideas lab in 2016, and there's five cohorts of us. We specifically focus on the field component. There's early career, there's graduate, um, there's gatekeepers. And so we're cohorts of people, five to nine PIs per group, that work to do this type of work, to bring awareness to diversity in the field disciplines because we, do not, we don't retain. When we have a science that there's a field component, we lose those students. We lose them. Particularly, we've been addressing the sexual assault on women and alcoholism in the field. Alcohol use, not involved. Alcohol use in the field. Um, like that, that's a dangerous and unwelcoming environment. When we talk about having students from native communities where addiction is a problem, we've added a whole other layer of trauma and stress to these students being in the field science. So there, there's a group, it's called Golden. If you, if you Google it, um, it's hosted by NCAR and UCAR, and you'll see all the, all the groups that are there. And um, the next workshop for field will be at the Ecological Society of America conference in August 11th. And then in May of next year, we'll have our third cohort where we bring the two first two cohorts together and um, see what they learned and how they can teach each other. And so we're, we're continuing that work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's One more question. question. Mary. So um, I'm Mary Wojtek. I'm a program officer at NASA. Uh, and I want to first of all thank you for your patience and the work that you're doing to try to educate um, program officers. Um, you started on a bit of a, um, a path when you were answering one of the questions before that made me really perk I up. I distracted, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, my question is about that path you went on before you self-corrected. And that was um, when the question was asked about what is it that we're doing that's annoying? Um, and one one of the things that you started to talk about was the fact that uh, if an, a proposal from an indigenous person comes in, don't automatically just select it because you get your portfolio yeah. diversity. Um, so yeah. I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about that because I, I do think as a program officer, um, I, I know that maybe I have done something like that, but not to check a box, but because right. I feel uh, my understanding, and maybe this is because I haven't asked anyone, is um, it's really important to have models and to show that the, that a group can be successful mm -hmm. and that that actually encourages other groups, you know, whether it's it's a person or a discipline or whatever, it's, it's a way to recruit and invite. And so I'm just interested in hearing what you have to say yeah. about that. Yeah, so some of that work, the fear for me is we have these broadening participation initiatives, right, and requirements. And you can go to NSF and probably other funding agencies and look at their diversity portfolio of how many students are completing degrees and how much money is going into it. And so one of my fears is that we're going to be fun we're funding two things. We're funding indigenous proposals. We're recruiting students. They're not succeeding. We have a revolving door. There's a program. Their agenda is to graduate two native students. This is hypothetical. Two native students. They do graduate too. How many more students went through that program and didn't succeed? And more importantly, in the state of Alaska, the suicide rate from students who don't succeed in college is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And it is traumatic. I'm going to cry. I've had three, four students in my own community commit suicide. And it is gut-wrenching to see the life wiped out of these kids' eyes when they feel like they can no longer go into science because this is going to happen to them. There's a social obligation to working with these communities. When we're driving, the funding agencies are at the top of, of driving that policy. And there is a responsibility to the communities that we're funding. There really is. I know a lot of them are like, no, there's not. There is. We are allowing PIs to do this work when they're not prepared to do it, first of all. The other is, oh, I'm going to train a thought here, um, is to meet that quota. So now we're saying, okay, we put all these millions of dollars into Native education, they're not graduating, we're going to quit looking at Native people, we're going to quit funding these people. When the bottom line is, they weren't being funded correctly anyway. The PI was getting the money, they didn't have the relationship with the community, and so they turned course and they worked on another community. But the money is still um, coded as Indigenous funding. So now the money's gone away. So we have two impacts here, and if we don't do these things correctly, when we're working with diverse populations, we cause a lot of social damage, and we perpetuate the social damage and historical trauma that's already been there. But bringing that to people's, again, you're trying to fund, you're trying to get your program going, your work, but we don't stop to think of these things because we've never experienced it. How many of you have been in a community of 350 people and you're related to everyone? We don't think of things like that. And so, 
lifelong learning on what is diversity, what, is, what are we doing with these communities. And I'll tell you this, and I tell all the program officers, Google is your friend. Google that tribe, see what, they all have websites. You can see who the leadership is. When you get that proposal, you can see who the leadership is for education, for science. There's a person listed, and if they're not on that letter, and I've seen many letterheads come in of a community member who took the tribal letterhead, wrote the letter, and gave it to the PI. The PI didn't know the community member I have no authority to grant anybody access to anything, and they didn't either. So learning, learning and staying diligent, it's just another thing to add, but if we're gonna do these things in an ethically responsible and culturally aligned way, where we're not creating damage, that's what we have to do. And so that's the two, my two fears is the social damage we're gonna perpetuate and the, the removal of funding because we're not having success in these diverse communities. Does that answer? Okay. Well, how done at Kalag, and thank you very much. Okay. Please join me in thanking Wendy for this fabulous talk. Thanks.